let me uh, introduce our next speaker. Uh, um, our next speaker is uh, Yoav Point from UCSD, and he's going to talk about better universal prediction using drifting games. OK. All right. Um, uh, uh, do you hear me OK? There seems to be a buzz. OK. All right. So uh, I wanted to thank uh, Mayor Feder and the organizers to invite me to give a talk here. It's really, um, it's really great for me to be here and uh, all of a sudden see all my, some of my friends from the past, like uh, Dana Ron I saw is here, and uh, uh, Amir Ben David, and uh, Naftali Tishbi, and uh, not to mention Noga Alon, and it's, uh, it's amazing. So um, anyway, so I'm going to talk about this uh, universal prediction using drifting games. Uh, but I'll start by basically trying to sell you an app, okay? So here's the app. Um, you see it says go, and then you play uh, odd even against it, okay? So you type ones and zeros, and um, uh, the computer tries to predict what you are going to do. And uh, whenever the computer is right, the blue dot goes forward, and whenever you are right, your dot goes forward. And the goal is to get to the end of the circle um, first, okay? So that's, that's, that's the goal. And at this point, the bot has gone much before you, and now it's one, and now you can see the board for that day. I was the only one play, or that hour. But if you look at all time, there are all kinds of people that played, um, and so on. Okay, so, so this is the mind reading game. It basically tries to predict what you're going to hit next, the one or the zero. So how should you play this game? Okay, so if you uh, think in terms of min-max, the way to play this game is to flip a random coin. That's the, the min-max uh, strategy for uh, playing this game. And indeed, if two computers would play uh, this game against each other, that's what they'll play and it will be very boring. But humans find it very, very hard to be human, to be <laughs> to human, to be, to be random. That was a slip. Right, that's also, yeah, never mind that. Uh, okay, humans find it very hard to be random, right? So um, if you don't believe me, just go and try the app. Uh, by the way, if you missed all the URLs and so on, there, there's a little stack of orange cards right here that you can take home with you, and that will tell you where to go. Okay, so. Humans find it very hard to uh, be random, and the computer wins by predicting the human. Okay, so the computer basically sees, um, predicts what you're going to hit next. Okay, but here's the rub. If the computer is predicting you, then it is not playing min-max, right? It's not playing random, it's playing something that predicts you. So in principle, if you, um, if you knew that, in principle, at least, you can win by predicting the computer, right? Because you both, the computer deviates now from being random, so maybe you can be smarter and deviate and basically win against the computer. This doesn't happen, okay? So here is some statistics about what happened in recent 6,000 games, okay? So what you have in the green line is what would happen if, uh, if you'd play exactly random, okay? So what you have here, uh, on the horizontal axis is the score at the end of the game, like how much ahead or behind you are. And, um, and it's basically just a cumulative distribution function. Okay? And you see that this is what is random and that people have a very hard time matching that. Okay? And even if you look at the very, very top here, you see that basically it's, it's, it's basically very, very hard to, to be better than random. Okay, so people, as hard as they try to basically trick the computer, uh, they in general are beaten by the prediction of the computer. Okay, so this is not a new game. Yes, so, yes. So you know that people really try to play random or they're trying to be so <coughs> uh, Well, I, I only have anecdotal uh, knowledge. I know that people in the beginning um, try to try. At the beginning, they just try, and then they, then they say, "Oh, I know how to do it, and I'm going to beat the computer." And then they lose really badly. Okay, so so it's 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 a lot of it is psychology. And in fact, this was pointed out by Shannon 
when he wrote in 1953 this paper called a mind reading question mark machine, right? Uh, so he put the question mark, I don't really put the question mark anymore because I think that it's just true, it reads your mind. Um, so the interesting thing here is that he says, yeah, from the game theoretical angle, uh, angle it is related to von Neumann and Morgenstern with their min-max theorem, but it's also related from the psychological point of view to Edgar Allan Poe, the purloined letter. Okay, so he actually refers, he says actually what he did is much more related to the purloined letter than to Edgar Allan Poe. And here's the relevant piece from the purloined letter. It says, so on, I knew one about eight years of age whose success at guessing in the game of even and odd attracted universal admiration, right? So somebody was a kid, was able to intuit what people are going to do and basically beat them in odd even, okay? So it's about psychology, right? It's really about how our brain works. Okay, so what's the plan of the talk? That was the motivator. But I'm going to basically tell you some about the theory that we used, it's, Shannon used different things, but uh, what we used uh, to, to build this app. Um, so first I'm going to tell you about, a little bit about how to use expert advice, which is relatively older work. And um, it's just to kind of put you in the frame, frame of mind and let you read about it later. And then I'm going to go to something much more, much more focused, which is the decision theoretic online learning and I'm going to give you several algorithms for this, uh, for this uh, problem and end with an open problem that I'm actually very excited if somebody could solve. Okay, so how does our mind reader work? So what we basically think of is that there is the human sequence, the 1001 0, 0, 1, and so on. Then there is the computer predictions, and the computer predictions were going to allow numbers between 0 and 1, which correspond to the computer is going to choose which bit to use randomly. And then there is the loss that, like, what's the probability you make a mistake, and then you can accumulate it. Okay, so the basic idea is that you look at the sequence, you want to predict the next bit, Okay, so you look at the past bits that you've seen and you give them to a set of experts, okay? So these experts look at the past, they can also look at other side information and so on. It's really quite unrestricted and they come up with their own predictions, okay? They say, I think it's going to be one, I think it's going to be zero, okay? And then you have a master algorithm that combines all of these predictions and uh, comes up with, with the master's prediction. Okay, so that's how things go. As you see here, there is nothing here that is fundamentally stochastic, right? The experts, you can think about them sometimes as stochastic models, but uh, they're really, um, this is really just a game theoretic setup. Okay, so how do we combine expert advice? The basic, um, the basic uh, idea here is that uh, the goal is to predict a binary sequence with minimal error, and we have some number n of experts, and all of the predictions are in the range 0 to 1. And so it goes something like this. Um, here we have all the four experts in this case, and in the first time step, we see what the experts predicted, okay? And then, uh, the master, looking at all of the experts and looking also at the cumulative loss of the experts so far, that at this point is zero because they haven't done anything, um, basically takes some kind of average of their predictions, weighted average, and that's the, the master's own prediction. And uh, yeah, the master also has a cumulative loss. And um, then we see the outcome. Nature comes up with the outcome. So everybody suffers some loss. The master suffers a loss, 0 0.21, be 29, because the prediction was 0 0.71. And uh, each of the, of the experts uh, suffers a loss, right? 0 0.7 is 0 0.3, 0 is 1, and so on. Okay, so that's one iteration. 
And then we basically do this repeatedly. OK, so this is the first iteration. In the second iteration, we have, again, the predictions made by the experts. And then we, we look at the accumulated loss of the experts so far. And using that, we come up with a prediction of the master. Right, the master, intuitively, what it'll do, it'll look at those experts that suffered the least loss cumulatively and give them the most weight. Right, it wants to basically find what is the good expert to, to follow. And then this is repeated. And now I'm going to just repeat it, um, just looking at the cumulative loss of the experts and of the master and the outcome in a few more iterations. This is a completely made up example. And let's say that we're now at this iteration five. What we're interested in is the difference between the cumulative loss of the master algorithm, which is 0 0.9, and the cumulative loss of the best, uh, best expert in hindsight, 0 0.8. Okay, so 0 0.9 is not much larger than 0 0.8, and that's basically what we want to happen that you're never much worse than the best expert in hindsight. OK. So just to reiterate, the game is on each iteration. Each expert makes a prediction. The master algorithm makes its own prediction. The opponent reveals the outcome. Each expert and master suffer a loss. In this case, absolute value of O minus P. And the goal is to minimize the difference or to that the cumulative loss of the master is never much larger than the cumulative loss of the best expert. OK, and this difference plays a central role in what we're doing. This uh, difference, we call it the regret. OK, so the regret is the difference between the loss of the master and the loss of the best expert in hindsight. And you can think about it naturally as regret. I regret that I didn't just follow that expert all the time. OK, so my first, uh, my first uh, introduction to this uh, problem was actually a paper by uh, Feder, Merchav, and Gutmann from 1992. And I'm not going to talk about the whole paper. I'm just going to talk about one important central piece of it, uh, in which you basically consider that there are just two experts. OK, so one expert always predicts one. The other expert always predicts 0. OK, so suppose that n0 and n1 are the number of zeros and ones that you've seen so far. The cumulative error of the best expert is simply the minimum of these two, right? And the naive solution is, OK, let's just go always with the best expert so far, right? But that's actually a bad idea because of what I call the flip-flop sequence. OK, so suppose the sequence is 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. Then at every iteration, the best expert right now is going to be the bad expert next time. OK, so you're going to actually do much worse than the best expert. So you need to hedge somewhere in the middle. That's the basic intuition, right? If you have the number of zeros more or less the same as number of ones, you need to play randomly. OK, so that's... Uh, that randomly, the way that uh, the paper had it, is this figure. OK, so here you have the fraction of ones. And here you have the probability with which you predict a one. OK, and what you have is you have that outside of some range, around a half, you predict deterministically. If you have three quarters of the outcomes are one, and you know the sequence has been long enough, then you're going to predict uh, one. OK, but if it's close enough to 0, then you hedge. And you hedge along this linear line. And the important parameter is this width. Like, how far from a half do you need to hedge? OK, so it turns out that a good choice is that to set epsilon to be equal to 1 over square root of n, where n is the length of the sequence. And then the regret the difference between how much you are 
worse than the best expert is also order of one over square root of n. Okay? And what's the intuition? The intuition is simply that let's imagine right now that the sequence was actually generated by, an unbi by a biased coin, and we don't know the bias. Okay? So if you think about it that way, then there is a binomial distribution around the bias of the coin. Okay? And the width of this binomial distribution is about 1 over square root of n. So if you're outside of 1 over square root of n, then you're sure that you need to, then you're sure that your bias is above a half or below a half. If you're within, you need to hedge. Okay? So that's the rough intuition. Of course, the, the argument itself is different because you want to show that this holds for any sequence, not just for sequences that are generated by a bias coin. Okay, so uh, in a very long and complex paper that we wrote after um, the, basically it was, it was to a large degree inspired by the Feder Merhab Gutmann paper, uh, we showed a pretty general method for solving this problem. So uh, I'm not going to show you the method because I'm going to show you something much more specific in a minute, but basically you have the outcome is 0 or 1, the prediction is any number between 0 and 1, and the loss is this absolute loss. And uh, we gave an algorithm that uh, combines a set of n experts and basically gives you a regret bound of this form. So the leading term is the square root of the length of the sequence times log of the number of experts. Okay? And we had actually a kind of hedging in that paper that is very similar in, in a sense to the, to, to the hedging that uh, was done in Feder's paper, but we showed that there's actually a slackness there. So you could do any function that is between a lower bound and an upper bound would basically, according to this analysis, give you the same results. Obviously, it won't give you the same results, but the analysis is limited to that level. Okay, so in fact, this is what is used in the app that I showed you. Of course, you, then you need to say what are the experts, and the experts that we use are basically the context tree algorithm, if you know what that is. Okay, so this, uh, this was new in a sense. It was new in the sense that we were interested in this absolute loss error. But there's a long history of doing bounds of that kind, what's called individual sequence bounds. And so the first and most famous, I think, is the log loss, right? So instead of the loss that uh, I talked about, you talk about this entropic loss. Uh, and this corresponds to coding length in, in, uh, in, uh, in source coding theory. And then uh, it's um, the optimal algorithm for doing that is basically the Bayes algorithm. And uh, it's, it's really a very, there's, there's many, many beautiful things to say about, about uh, this, this loss. It's like we consider it the queen of losses. Okay, but sometimes you, are not, you don't get the option, right, to, to basically choose your loss. Like in coding, you might get, but in some other case, like, like, uh, like uh, betting, you might not get. I mean, the betting is usually referred to as being a version of that, but this is really just if you go and you basically have a multiplicative update. So you, every time you take your money and you invest all of your money. Suppose instead that every day you buy a lottery ticket for $1, and then maybe you get with probab some probability $2, right? So then, then there's no multiplication, and then it's much more like this. Okay, and then there's another loss, square loss, that corresponds to regression. Now, the important thing about these two losses is that you can get bounds that are like log n over t. Log n over t. So these are something we call mixable losses. These are losses that basically you can, you can mix the experts without really having any significant penalty. But if you talk about this loss, the absolute loss, uh, that corresponds to classification error. So it's relevant to machine learning. And uh, the regret bounds are order of log n over square root of t. 
and there's lower bounds to match it, so you know that you can't get better. Okay? So this is a very, very advanced area at this point since we started working on it. And so all I can say is if you want to know more, I highly recommend this book. Okay, so this is the book by Nicolo Cesabianchi and Gabor Lugosi called Prediction, Learning, and Games. And it has a huge combination, a huge collection of these kind of uh, results. Okay. All right, so now we're getting to the meat of the talk, and we're going to talk about a more simplified problem, uh, which is still holds the main crux of the of the difficulty, but kind of gets rid of the extra structure of the lo loss function. Basically, it's without, without loss, without a loss function. So what do I mean by that? So in this setup, there are no predictions and no loss functions. What is there in, instead? There's just hedging, okay? So what the, the iteration is at the first, the um, master algorithm puts a distribution or puts a weighting that is then normalized to a distribution over the, uh, over the actions or the experts. We t like to call them actions here because it relates to game theory. And uh, then um, each one of the actions suffers a loss. And the loss is bounded between zero and one, okay? And so then that comes again, you, the, the the algorithm puts weights, it will put more weight on things that suffered less loss, okay? Okay, so basically this iterates, right? So the only, the only thing that happens is the master puts a weight vector and the loss vector is revealed by nature. And then you take the dot product. Okay, so here is a, a more formal description. Um, the master algorithm chooses a weighting of the actions. The opponent reveals a loss for each action. The master suffers a we the weighted loss. The simply the, um, the losses of the experts weighted by the distribution they put on the experts. And the goal is the same as before. Okay, so we want to minimize regret. We want to not be, never be much worse than the best action in hindsight. <clears throat> okay, so let me use a little bit more notation. So let's say that these are the weights, where with the uh, superscript is the time and the subscript is the number of the expert. And the instantaneous loss, I'm sorry, I keep switching between plus one, minus one, and zero one. Um, it's not a fundamental difference. Um, so the losses at each iteration are, uh, are bounded in some range. And then the loss of the algorithm is simply the weighted loss. And the cumulative loss is simply the sum for each expert, for each action, it's the sum of the losses of that action. Of that action. And for the master, it's the sum of these losses. Okay, simple enough. And uh, then we talk about the cumulative regret, okay? So it's the difference between the cumulative losses of the, uh, of the expert and of, of a particular uh, action, okay? So this is indexed by I, regret relative to action I. And the goal is that RIT will be smaller or equal to uh, some function just of N and T so independent of the actual sequence of losses, and such that the limit when t goes to infinity of f and t over t will be zero. Okay, so the regret relative to the number of steps will go to zero. Okay. So, um, so here is the hedge algorithm. The hedge algorithm is nothing but a piece out of the how to use expert advice. But it's a simple, simpler piece, so it's kind of easier to expand it. Okay, so the initial weights are uh, uniform. The weight update rule is um, 
<coughs> that we just take the weight at time iteration t and multiply it by e to the minus this parameter eta times the loss of that expert. Okay? Or to say it differently, you can just say it's e to the minus eta times the cumulative loss of that expert. Um, right. So this has a lot of similarity to Bayesian posterior averaging. So this is the prior probability, the 1 over n, and you can vary that. Um, this is the posterior probability. And these are the learning, this is the learning rate. Now the learning rate is the one thing that doesn't really make it quite fit with Bayes. In Bayes, there's no learning rate. But otherwise, it seems very similar. And um, the way that you analyze it is based on potential. Now potential will play a big role uh, in the rest of the talk, so uh, let me explain how we argue that the algorithm performs well using potential. So we say that potential at time t plus 1 is simply the total weight at, uh, at time t plus 1, okay? The unnormalized weight. That's the definition of the potential. And what we can show is that if the algorithm has large loss, uh, then the total weight at the end must be small, right? So if basically the algorithm made a lot of mistakes, then the total weight at the end has to be small. That's something that is just algebra to show. And on the other hand, that if there is a good expert, the weight cannot be too small, right? And putting these together, you get the bound. And the bound is the following form. Basically, it says that the total loss of the algorithm at time t is eta times lit times the total loss of expert i at time t plus lan n divided by 1 minus e of minus eta. OK, so, so is this good or is this bad? Um, first of all, it's good in the sense that it's uniform over i. There's no, basically, you can just write it as minimum over, minimum over the, the expert. But the thing that remains is that you need to tune somehow the learning rate. OK, so here's a particular tuning. If we set the learning rate to be square root of 2 lan n over, over t, then we're guaranteed that the, that the loss of the algorithm is the minimum loss of the experts plus 2t lan n plus lan n, OK? If we choose things like that. And so now if we divide by t, we get that this is smaller or equal to 2t. Um, that the regret is just these two terms, okay? And so that the regret per iteration goes to zero, like one over square root of t. Okay, so basically we, we, um, we, found, we found that. Um, sorry, I don't know, the order here is a little messed up, but uh, this graph basically gives you the intuition about the setting of the learning rate. If the sequence is short, if the time is short, and there are many, many experts to try to sift through, then you need a fast learning rate. And you get a bound that is a linear bound like this. If the, the, if the time is long, or the number of experts is small, then you can take your while with learning. and so then you get a bound that is here. But if you choose the learning rate, as I said, um, then, then uh, you get, you get what, what, what I said, right? So if you, if you choose the learning rate as a function of t, then you get this nice uh, bottom curve underneath them. So the question is, is it be possible to do better? So remember, Going back to the mind reading game, what was the best strategy? Just random, right? So let's see what random would give us. So, 
suppose that we have uh, an adversary, and the adversary, the way that they, that they generate the sequence is just binary 0 or 1 at each, uh, sorry, here it's plus 1, plus 1, minus 1 at, uh, at each step. So this is really just a random walk, right? Um, so each one of the expert of the actions has loss plus one or minus one at uh, at each step, and there are many experts. So um, so the cumulative loss defines a random walk, right? The cumulative loss of each one of the experts, but there are many experts. There are n of them. So one of them, just at random, would be significantly better than just zero, right? And there's nothing you can do against that, right? So that's basically the only thing that you can do is, uh, is always weigh things uniformly. And the optimal cumulative loss is, uh, of the master is always zero, right? Because just by averaging enough of those, you just get always zero. But one of the actions will be significantly better, right? So that's basically our lower bound, and if you calculate it out, then you find out that with high probability, one of the n actions has cumulative loss smaller than minus square root of 2t ln n. Okay? So, so there's really a matching lower bound, or so it seems. But it's not really quite the lower bound that we want because uh, or it's not, it's, the story doesn't end here, luckily, because, um, because it's true that we can get this if we, if we uh, tune the learning rate like that, but that basically means that we know how long the sequence would be when we start, right? And uh, that's not a reasonable assumption, right? We want basically something that will just continue go on and on and will always have a bound. And, um, and you somehow need to tune, to tune this. And so if we look again at the flip-flop, what we see is that, so this is basically the, a flip-flop where the, there, is, there is a general improvement. So every time one expert uh, loses zero and the other expert loses one, okay? And so they alternate, so, so basically this loss goes up. Um, any one of the fixed learning rates will just give you a line like this, and the lower bound is this line. So we want something that will match the lower bound, but we're not really getting it, right? We're not really getting it because we're setting t according to a priori information. Okay, so some, to some degree this was solved. Um, So there is work that shows basically, okay, let's suppose that we don't know t in advance or we don't know the cumulative loss in advance. So, um, so um, what, we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to, say, to, to uh, set the learning rate according to the total loss of the best expert at time t, uh, t minus one. Okay, so using that, you can get desired bound for all t, okay? So you can get the, the bound that doesn't, you don't need to know t in advance. Slight, slightly worse constants. But there is still a dependence on n, right? But what do I mean by dependence on n? Of course it depends on n, right? Because, because n is a constant, right? Uh, well, not really. I would say the n is not a real parameter. It's not. The, the natural parameter that you want to use. Um, because, for instance, this example. Suppose that you have n actions and they're really divided into m groups. And inside each group, you have all of the actions suffering exactly the same sequence of losses, right? Then you would want your bound to depend on m, not on n, right? You want to, the bound to really depend on the richness of the set, not on just th this arbitrary number that might not really represent very much. And sometimes we actually want to have uncountably many actions. That's actually when you think about estimation and learning, it's a very common thing that you want the number of models 
or the models to be parameterized by some continuous parameters. Okay, so, so then n doesn't have a meaning. So the alternative is to assume some kind of prior distribution over the actions, and then assume that the action mass, okay, so these, these actions are really a continuum, um, is infinitely divisible. You can always divide it as any way that you want. Okay, so then we talk about, instead of n, we talk about an epsilon quantile. Um, how much time? Okay. Um, so we talk about an epsilon quantile. So we basically say that instead of regret to the best action, we want to compare the performance to the best epsilon quantile. Okay, so we just say, okay, how much, how much do I, how, for, for any epsilon, I want to cut it over there and I want to basically be almost as good as that. Of course, as epsilon goes to zero, your regret will relatively grow, but you still want it for all epsilon. So we can do that. Okay, so we can do something like that. We can basically replace in all of our formulas, we can replace the number of expert by lan one over epsilon. But again, the problem with that is that we're committing to a particular epsilon, right? In the learning rate. So the algorithm depends on this epsilon. So the question is, uh, we're tuning n uh, eta for particular epsilon, can we guarantee a bound that holds simultaneously for all epsilon, okay? And one different way to say it is, can we have an algorithm without a learning rate? Okay, so um, now I'm going to go to binomial weights, which is, again, an old algorithm, but that kind of shows that there is a completely different way to, uh, think, about, um, to think about these, these problems. Okay, so let's think about, we're going to go a little bit simpler. Um, uh, we want to predict a binary sequence as before and make as few mistakes as possible. And there are n experts, but the predictions are binary. Okay, so that you can either, each expert can either predict zero or one, and the master can either predict zero or one. Um, but there is this other piece of information that I'm giving you, which is that I know that there is an expert that, makes n that never makes more than k mistakes. How do I know that? Not clear, but let's go with that assumption. Okay, so in this paper from 1996, uh, we showed a way of analyzing this um, problem as a type of drifting game. And instead of uh, explaining what is a drifting game, I'll just show you the example. Okay, so you start, you think about the number of mistakes made so far as the x-axis, okay? The loss of the expert i. And then at time zero, all of the experts are here, okay? And so in general, when we will go forward in time, there'll be this lattice, right? So some experts will suffer loss one, some experts will suffer loss zero. And you'll just go on like that. Okay, so let's think just intuitively, how should we play on the first iteration? So there's, some of the experts are predicting one, some are predicting zero, how should we predict? Well, we should pretty obviously predict zero. Right? We should predict with the majority. Right? Because if the majority is wrong, then we're moving a lot of experts down the line. And we know that there is this threshold here. Once the experts fall out of this k equal five, we know that they are not the good expert. We can ignore them. Okay, so, so we, suppose we predict and suppose we're wrong, then the, the next configuration would be this, right? Okay, so that's good, that's easy. Now what about the next one? Next iteration, some of these will predict one, some of these will predict zero. For each bin, you'll have a split. Now the question is, how should we, um, 
how should we predict now? So we basically want to say, what will happen if we predict this way and make a mistake? What will happen if we predict that way and make a mistake? So if we predict zero and make a mistake, then the next configuration will be this. If we predict one and make a mistake, then the next configuration will be this. Right? It's either the, green, the greens move up or the, one, or the, or the uh, purple move up. OK? So, so that's basically the dynamics of the game. And now let's think about how does the game end. OK, so the game ends when you reach an illegal configuration. Right? An illegal configuration has no experts or no actions that, that, uh, whose cumulative loss is, that made uh, no more than five mistakes. Basically, everybody makes more than five mistakes. So what does that mean? That means that our prior assumption was incorrect. And if we assume that our assumption is correct, that cannot happen. So we know exactly how to predict. Right? We need to predict in a way that the next configuration will be consistent with the assumption. OK, so if an error would lead to this configuration, then the error is not possible. So this is a safe prediction. So the algorithm goal is what? It's, it's to get to the illegal configuration with the smallest number of mistakes, right? Every mistake, this is the amortized analysis part of it, is basically every mistake, you're moving mass up, and you will stop when all the mass is out of the one, zero to k, uh, zero to five. And uh, so, so you want to do that, you want to move mass as fast as possible out of here. OK, so how do we analyze this? If these are discrete, it actually becomes quite complex, but, and you can't find necessarily the min-max solution. But if you make them continuous, as I said before, then you can. OK, so assume that the set of experts is continuous and arbitrarily divisible. Um, and then what your previous assumption became, becomes that is basically that the, the fraction that you want to compete against is epsilon equal 1 over n, right? So, so, the, so we want to find an algorithm with the tightest uh, uniform upper bound on that cumulative loss. OK, so the, the, what was illegal configuration before that it, this was completely empty is now a slightly different illegal configuration where the total weight of 0 to 5 is less than 1. OK, that contradicts the assumption. So what does the optimal strategy, what does the optimal adversary do? So now, basically, we made this game such that the, the, the game is completely tight in its analysis. And so we can start by actually thinking, what would be the worst thing for the adversary to do? And it turns out to be split each bin to two equal parts. OK? Uh, or equivalently, this is, this is the same as prediction of each expert, our RID 0, 1. Well, how much more time do I have? Six minutes. Six minutes, OK. All right. Um, OK, I have to go faster. So, so, so basically, that's the best strategy. And once you know what is the best thing for the adversary, you can come up with your own best strategy. Um, and what you get at the end, I mean, you get basically new definition for potentials. These potentials are not exponential like I, I had before, but they are like binomial tail. And, um, and using these potentials, you can basically get an algorithm that always chooses the next configuration that has the minimal potential. Okay? And what that gives you is, I'll skip this, is basically uh, an algorithm that is min-max optimal. Okay, so in this setting, you, the, this algorithm that I described is min-max optimal. There's no, there's no looseness at all. Um, and it has better bounds than the exponential weight. Um, the, um, the, 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 the thing that we want to get rid of is that the a priori assumption that one of the experts has loss at most k. And we want a bound 
on the regret without any assumptions, right? Again, like before, we don't want to know T or N or we, we want no assumptions. And, uh, the, and we want the instantaneous loss to be any number in the range 0, 1 rather than just 0 or 1. So this leads to this much more recent work on something called normal hedge that, uh, uh, again, I'll just go very quickly over. Um, so that's, that's an algorithm that basically fulfills more or less those, those uh, what we wanted as improvements of, of uh, binomial weight. Um, yeah, and it has, um, so instead of the binomial weights where the potential function depends on the loss and the number of remaining mistakes, that was the parameters of the potential function, here we have a potential function that is based on the regret, so it just looks at the regret, and the variance of the positive cumulative regrets. So basically, how, how, how wide is the distribution of the cumulative regrets? Right? The wider the distribution, the harder it is for us to, to hold on to the best one or to the best epsilon. OK, and the potential basically looks like this, R, x r squared over 2c. And this potential gives these weights. And the intuition is that, again, this uh, adversary that is a random play, if we have an adversary that plays a random play, then we get that the distribution of the uh, regrets is, um, is normal, or at least has the right hand normal, right? And um, if it is normal, then we cannot have the potential function, that's the maximum speed which we can have the potential function grow. To match, the, to match the normal distribution. If we made the potential function grow faster, then basically we know that it will increase and increase a lot. Okay, so I'm not even going to go through the algorithm, but I'll just show you an example of how this looks. So suppose that you have experts and, uh, and this is their cumulative loss, okay? And suppose that this is where the master algorithm is right now. It's trying to always stay, stay up with the top one, okay? So the potential now looks kind of this interesting thing. It's completely flat up to the loss, out of the cumulative loss of the master, and then it grows like e to the x squared, so faster than exponential. So it completely ignores basically actions that, uh, whose, whose um, cumulative loss is worse than the master. And then this is how it relates to exponential weight. And the other thing about it is that it has this parameter C inside. And this parameter basically plays the role of learning rate, but it's completely self-tuning. So um, what this means is that uh, this width here is square root of CT. Okay. And when we have a new um, iteration, then all of the examples move, right? All of the, sorry, all of the expert cumulative loss moves. And so also the master moves. And now that we're in this new configuration, we update CT to CT plus one. Okay, so that basically makes this wider. And CT plus one is something that grows basically like t. Okay, so that's what we saw, what we proved in 2009 is that uh, you have a bound on the algorithm that behaves like this. It has a 3t um, lan n. And if you want to write it in terms of epsilon, it has the right dependence on epsilon, but, okay, but it here it, uh, uh, basically, you lose, um, the, still has a dependence on n. Oh. So, so time is up. Um, okay, let's see. So, okay, so, so the, the, main, the main thing that is disappointing is that, that it still has a dependence, even weak dependence on n, but a year ago, there was normal hedge dt, normal hedge in de deterministic time, in which uh, Luo and Shapiri showed that uh, by a slight tweaking of the algorithm, 
um, you can basically get a bound that is completely independent of the of the um, of of n. Okay, so so they got a bound like this. Now now there is no dependence on the number of experts. So you can completely you can completely use it on continuous experts, but it's still discrete time, and that's what I don't like about it. So my open problem, just to finish, is is that it, t is actually not a, a, a real parameter either, because if you, when you actually have losses, the losses are, uh, the, the regrets are all smaller than the, 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 the regrets of the, of the experts, then also your regret should be smaller. So it really depends on, on somehow the variation of the regrets, uh, how much time should advance. And uh, so there is a hypothesis that we can achieve that. So you can basically have a bound just like what we have, but that the dependence of the bounds uh, on, on time is not really directly on time, but on the accumulation, accumulation of variances. Okay, so how much the, the experts vary. Okay, so there's recent progress, but it's not significant enough to talk about. And so that's it. Thank you very much. So we have time for one question. Uh, yes. So if I understand correctly, the goal is to find, to follow the best experts and not the best possible aggregation of experts. Right. right. Why, why is that the target? Because you can, by aggregating well, experts. Yeah, but, but that's, that's a bigger set. So you could basically, you know, because now we're not really counting numbers, we're just counting volumes. So you can basically say the, ex, the set of experts is really every um, linear combination of the base experts. And now you can do as good as that. Now, the question of computational efficiency comes in. The, the real question that comes in when you want to use this is, do you need to keep a weight per each expert? If you need to keep a weight per each expert, it becomes computationally infeasible. So there is a whole line, other line of work, and if you look at the book, there's, there's a lot of work about competing with the best linear combination. And these are different algorithms. Yes? Um, why? Simply we were driven to it because that appears to be the, the optimal thing to do. Um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, we, 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 the, 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 the bound, the, everything here is driven by the bounds, right? It's not experimental stuff. It's basically uh, we want to prove that for every sequence some bound will hold. And we know how to do it for those. There are some other things. Again, in the book, there is a complete review of those. Okay. All right. Any other questions offline? Thank you all again.